We have a certain class of clients that don't want to share their work and um, they're, they're the minority of our clients. But w with those clients, we still build their tooling on open source, for example, Postgres or Django, which is a web development framework in Python or what have you, open layers. Um, but they just decide not to share their work back. Welcome to another episode of the Mapscaping Podcast. My name is Daniel and this is a podcast for the geospatial community. My guest on the podcast today is Tim Sutton and he is a QGIS hacker. So he's been involved with the QGIS project for quite some time and he's also the co-founder of a company called Cartosa. So today I really wanted to get Tim on the podcast and talk about what it's like to build a business around open source. So the ins and outs of using open source as the foundation for a business. Lots of the people I've interviewed, talked with on the podcast have included open source products in their business, but we've never really discussed what it's like to base a business on open source. And that's what we're going to be doing today. Just want to say thank you to our sponsor for this episode, Langrid.com. This is the go-to resource for all things parcel data in the US. So not in other countries, just in the US. But if you need property data for the US, Langrid.com is the place to go. So they have a whole bunch of paid options. You can get at this data from a variety of different angles, but they also have some free things that you might find interesting. So on their website, for example, you can look up property boundaries and parcel data anywhere in the US for free. They also have a free Langrid mobile app. So if you need to look up parcels in the field on the go, that is a great option as well. Again, check out Langrid.com. Okay, let's get on with the interview. Welcome to the podcast, Tim. Um, I'm really grateful that you could be here today and I'm really looking forward to the conversation. So in, in recent podcast episodes, I've talked with, with people that have been running their own businesses. So they've been a consultant in the GIS industry, they've been a consultant in the um, earth observation industry, but you're doing something a little bit different. And we're, we're going to jump into that in just a second. And this whole topic is going to be about creating a business based on, on open source. You are a, a GIS hacker, you're an open source geek, and perhaps you could start off just by introducing yourself and telling us a little bit about the open source business that you're running. Sure. So yeah, I'm Tim Sutton. I'm the co-founder of Cartosa. So that's our business that we run. And we founded the business about six years ago and basically established the business to kind of address this lingering question that always comes up in a conversation when you talk about open source, which is, okay, if it's all made by if I can say in the colloquial way, a bunch of long-haired, sandal-wearing hippies, who's going to provide us support when we when we need it in our sort of mission-critical business environment? So we're sort of there to, to try and break the perception that if you want to invest in using open source in your company or in your organization, that you're going to kind of be left to your own devices in terms of supporting that software within your organization. I think that question comes up again and again. I mean, that fear that people have before they sort of jump out into open source, they're using some proprietary software today, you know, that, that mental shift to, okay, we could use something that's free is a long leap for, for some people. And I think before we sort of dive into the conversation around that, perhaps we could start off by defining what is open source software. Sure. So um, for me, there are many definitions. It's a bit of an amorphous thing. I think the most sort of commonly understood and accepted version of what open source is, is software that shares this, the actual instruction code for the software as well as the binary that you run on your computer as well. And there are a whole lot of different versions and va variants of how that sharing happens. But essentially, um, it gives you access to the underlying recipe for the software so that you can go and modify it and change it and adapt it for your own needs. So when you talk about different versions of how that sharing happens, are we talking about open source licensing? Yeah. So there, there is a sort of a spectrum of licenses and even uh, within each license, there is a spectrum of things that can happen. So on, on the one end, you've got these um, very permissive licenses, which basically allow you to kind of take the software and do whatever you like with it. And you probably are using software that comes from these sort of permissive license origins on your Windows or Mac or Linux machine already. And then through to the sort of other end, which is the sort of copyleft licenses, which I could say they embed a, uh, a requirement for sharing back into their license. So they say, well, we shared our uh, intellectual property with you and we expect you to share whatever improvements or um, enhancements you make 
back with us or with the community of users. I could add that within those, there are also um, uh, other sort of things that kind of uh, govern the way that people perceive open source licenses because if you have a software package like QGIS, for example, that is uh, under the GPL, the GNU public license, it could be that a group of people have built the software together and they all individually own sort of part of the IP of that software. Um, and then in other cases, companies or, or a single entity has uh, sort of accumulated the IP together and kind of owns the copyright of, the, of that software. And that's probably important when it comes to licensing because some software projects, for example, the Qt um, framework, which is the, the development framework that we built QGIS on, is, for example, dual licensed. So they, they have a ability to market to proprietary in, or in a proprietary way, but also in an open source way. These kind of things are only possible to do when there's a single owner of the, of the software. Wow. Okay. So it actually sounds like a bit of a minefield when you start diving into the details of these open source license agreements. But um, I, I think you've done a really good job of, of at least giving us a broad overview of the different sort of spectrums, I guess you could call it, of freedom in, in terms of these license agreements. And perhaps now would be a really good time to sort of move off and talk a little bit more about your company. So right at the start, you said that you started this company together with a co-founder to address that issue of open source can actually be a substitute for some of the other software that we see out there in the landscape. Could you tell us a little bit about the services and products that you're providing and then we'll sort of dive off into the, the open source nature of them and what it means to provide these services and products based on open source? Sure, so we basically provide about four different areas. So we, we do training and support for people that are trying to use, for example, QGIS or Postgres or um, all the sort of familiar open source software packages can give them training courses or we can provide support in their daily work, um, you know, with the help desk type functionality. And um, then we also do bespoke development and that's where the other three sort of areas come in. So we do web development, we do desktop application development and we do mobile application development. So typically those services relate to somebody expressing a need to solve a problem and they want to solve they want to solve it with open source sometimes they don't even care whether it's open source or not but we kind of build our solution on open source and we will build them a website or we will deploy a, an existing web um, application for example geonode or um, geo server or something like that for them and configure it and help them get it set up customize it if they need it um, and so on so you mentioned a couple of different sides of your business there, and the first one I think we should focus on is the training side. So this is training in open source software. I'm pretty sure that you mentioned things like PostGIS and, and QGIS. Um, could you talk a little bit about that side of it? Is that increasing with time? Is the interest for that increasing with time? So um, it, it is slowly, but not as much as we would like. And I think there is a lot of um, infrastructure that needs to happen around training before it can increase to the levels that we can really make it a primary part of our business. So training is often an adjunct to other services that we provide. So for example, if we're deploying a website with GeoNode or GeoServer or Postgres, we might also at the same time train the people that we're building the website for to use those tools. But in terms of people just walking in off the street, um, we haven't had as much uptake as we'd like. And I think a lot of that relates to certification and sort of compliance aspects. So for example, in South Africa, there is a, there is a standards body that requires training held for government employees to be compliant to this. They call it SACWA, S-A-Q-A. And if your training course is not compliant, you basically won't get an audience from, from government officials. And um, so there's a lot of these kind of things that happen around the world, which I think um, the sort of big software vendors have already spend a lot of energy and time and efforts to, to go and actually get that compliance and build themselves an audience um, in the training. So it is growing for us, but like I said, not as much as we would have liked it um, to. In terms of training, um, is it mostly the public sector that you're aiming at there or do you see interest from the private sector as well? And I guess what I'm getting at here is that, you know, GIS, geospatial, it's it's baked into so much, right? It's, it's, it's a part of so many different applications and, and use cases where do you see the, the interest coming from? Um, I would say primarily from government, but also we have people from private sector that are trying to solve their own problems like mining or drone mapping or what have you. And they, they want to, they've heard about open source and they want to kind of get skilled up more quickly than they would do just, you know, self-learning online. 
So it's a bit of a mix, but I, I think the primary audience that we've had up till now has been more from sort of government uh, organizations or big sort of uh, parastatal organizations like electricity infrastructure or, uh, you know, we've also done a lot of training in the humanitarian sector. And I don't know, we, we haven't sort of managed to appeal to that many people that want to self-study perhaps something like after university, they want to go and get their nerd credentials for, for geospatial software and come and do courses with us. What, what do you imagine the main motivation for people is? Like when, when we think about training, I, I realize we're sort of belaboring the point a little bit. We're going to move off shortly. But what do you think the main motivation is to come and get training for open source? Is it because it's free and it's cheap? Or, or do they see it as, as being better than the alternative in, in some other way? Again, I think it's a, a, a big mix of different things. So, if, you know, we definitely have an audience of people that think, you know, QGIS, for example, is the best thing <laughs> out there and they just uh, want to use it. But uh, usually cost comes into the equation and we can go on a side tangent, if you like, about, you know, free software is not free um, because everything costs you money. So if you're going to, for example, deploy a QGIS in your organization, you still need to buy computers to put it on. You still need to have the sysadmin you know, install the latest version if you're doing these sort of automated deployment setups. Um, and you still need to train people and you still need to spend time and effort configuring and deploying it in your organization. So that, that all has a cost. So the sticker price of the software gets removed, but the other surrounding costs don't get removed. And, and I guess that's where training normally comes in is that, you know, if you do your sums and you figure out, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend 10 weeks learning QGIS um, by myself so that I can do my tasks in my office versus I'm going to go and spend a week in a course and have somebody who really knows their way around the software just walk me through it. Um, you know, that cost equation normally works out in favor of, you know, going and doing a training course, but not always. It depends, you know, sometimes time is cheaper than paying for a, you know, paying for a course. So people, people value their time in different ways in different organizations. I think you made some really good points there about the, the sticker price, you know, because the software is free, that's great. So we're not paying for that. But there, there's a training element, there's an education element. And of course, that costs time and resources, which is a really important thing to consider for an organization, if they're thinking about moving in this direction. You also mentioned that you do web development. I'm curious, when, when people come to you for web development, do they come to you because it's based on open source? Or do they just have a problem that they want solved? Do, do they care what the machinery looks like? So again, we, we, we get a mix. We, everything um, we, we do is kind of a mix in a way that we definitely have a big audience of people that are um, that have bought into the idea of you know building their building their infrastructure on open source, and we provide a certain value proposition by building them a solution on open source. And then we also have people that are just oblivious to whether it's open source or not, and they're really interested in having their problems solved. And by osmosis, they often discover that there is additional value to be had from building their solution in open source. So I can give an example for one system that we've been building for biodiversity informatics, and that is you know, tracking um, the currents of species over time uh, within river systems in South Africa in this particular case. We started the conversation with the customers. They were not even really familiar with open source, but they just wanted to be able to plot dots on a map of where fish have been caught in rivers and so on. But in working with them over time, they start to realize all the additional value. And the kind of things that we normally tell customers when we explaining to them about open source is that the tool that we built for them in a way keeps the vendor honest in, in as much as that, because there's no lock-in with a particular vendor or very limited lock-in. I guess there's always a little bit of lock-in in terms of just the ramp up time of learning a different, you know, somebody else's code. Because we share something as open source, if the customer ever becomes dissatisfied with you, they can walk to another um, vendor's, you know, uh, office and knock on the door and say, would you support our, you know, our platform? It is probably true sometimes in proprietary software, but I think much less so. So it's much more difficult, for example, to somebody for somebody to choose a different Esri vendor because the, the vendors are all kind of proscribed by the parent company. So, yeah, so we often, uh, you know, sort of explain to our customers that there's this, this idea that you're deploying a system on open source and that gives you the freedom to choose which vendor serves your needs the best. And if we're not doing a good job, you can choose somebody else. And at the same time, it puts a little bit more pressure on ourselves to really do a good job because 
if we don't, we know that there's always the, the option for the customer to walk away and find another vendor. So sometimes people come to you because you you base your development on open source and sometimes they just find that out along the way and it's, and it's like a value add for them. If you were starting your business again today, would you go out and purposely brand yourself as being open source or would you just brand yourself as we solve geospatial problems? Um, I think I'd still do the same, <laughs> brand ourselves as open source. Just because um, we enjoy the way that um, you can work in the ecosystem of open source, the, the selection of tools, the low barrier to entry for coming up with the solutions. And I think that also that being an open source company, it tracks a certain mindset from your customers, which are maybe more progressive or more sort of thoughtful in their what their place in the world is, which is kind of what we as a company are also trying to do. We're not Obviously, we're trying to pay our salaries and everything, but we're not just here to make a buck. We're also here to kind of contribute something back to society. And we contribute by using the software because if nobody, if people make software and nobody uses it, then point of making the software is lost. And we also contribute by trying to give back to the parent projects that we build our solutions on. So for us, it's a... Uh, you know, it's not a, it's not religious. It's not zealotry. We we work with with people from any kind of um, uh, outlook in terms of how software should be built and deployed. But we just enjoy the the fact that we very often land up in projects where people have a kind of more um, sort of upliftment, I, I guess, approach to their to their work rather than just trying to make you know grab as much money and run out of the world as as as, as they can. So there's a lot of good reasons to to use open source. I, I think we all understand that now, and I'm sure a lot of people listening to this podcast are aware of open source. Perhaps they're perhaps they're users of the software themselves, and if they are, they'll understand that there's a lot of amazing functionality out there that's that's freely available. So so this is amazing. But I'm thinking in terms of building a business around something based on open source software, there must be some pitfalls. Is there anything that that you've noticed throughout your journey where you're like, ah, oh, I should I should tell people about that? because that is the difficult part of, of working with open source. There are a lot of pitfalls <laughs> and um, maybe they, um, a lot of the pitfalls of being a proprietary vendor are removed and replaced with different ones um, of, of being an open source company. Let me, let me try to break it down in different ways. So let's say, for example, you as a customer come to me and ask me to build a new feature on QGIS. Because um, QGIS is actually quite a big project with a broad community around it, there is a bit of difficulty in that if you ask me, let's say you want a pink button on the toolbar, which uh, fetches the latest Instagram picture of um, Kim Kardashian, something and puts it on the middle of the, the map. You can imagine that if I go to the community and say, I've been funded by my customer to add this button and I'd like to commit it. And there'll be a bit of a backlash and people won't um, want to accept it into the code base. And so you kind of walk this delicate line of trying to understand what the community will accept when you offer something to your client because the client has the expectation that what you build for them will become part of the QGIS or, or Postgres or whatever tooling um, you're working with. So you do need to make them aware of these sort of uh, sensitivities around what would be accepted in a project and with, you know, whether it's um, going to be actually make its way into the, the mainstream application. There's this concept of forking in open source, which is where um, and if, let's say if QGIS didn't want my big pink button, uh, I could go and make my own copy of QGIS and build a customized version for the client. And sometimes clients approach us and ask us to do that. And we are heavily resistant to doing that because it's a huge maintenance overhead. You can imagine that the moment in time when I split off from the original QGIS version to make my Kim Kardashian version, I've now got to kind of chase my tail trying to always keep my version in sync with what's happening upstream if the customer wants both the upstream changes plus their, their sort of not so acceptable changes. So that's one pitfall is just trying to, to make the client understand these things because they're not always very conscious of the fact that it's not a done deal. Like I can make a, I can make a contract with you and uh, promise you that I'll add your new feature in the application, but at the end of the road when I want to submit it to the project Somebody might say, no, I don't like that, or that, you know, they don't like the way I did it. And in QGIS, we have processes. Most projects have processes to try and manage this. So we've got a QEP, the QGIS Enhancement Proposal process, where you can actually sort of advertise what you're planning to do ahead of time and then uh, kind of get a bit of 
crowd approval before you actually go and build it. But that also makes sometimes quoting for a customer com more complicated because you sort of almost have to do a lot of the consulting and planning work beforehand before you can actually say, okay, right, I'm ready to do your project. So that's sort of one avenue of pitfall um, to deal with. The other one is that often customers, and I'm, there, there are different kinds of work. So I'm talking particularly about when customers ask us to add features to, to software. When, when customers ask us to add a feature, let's say again in QGIS, because that's the one I'm most familiar with, um, I will build it for them and add it to the software and the customer will sign the final you know, contract approval and pay me my last paycheck. And then the customer expects that in the long term, that feature continues to work. And also the QGIS project also expects that in the long term, that feature will be maintained by me because I've now contributed it. So there's a certain long-term responsibility to make sure that it works. And often that cost doesn't sort of get reflected in the contract that I make with the customer. So we as a company often find that we sort of self-sponsoring in part some of the work that we do for our customers. And it's uh, it's not a problem for us because we would be doing that anyway. And, and we can talk just now about like what other, how else we, we contribute to open source. But I mean, a lot of our a lot of our spare time and funds goes actually back into contributing anyway. But there's something that you need to be aware of that when you quote for a customer, you should quote not only for the thing you're building now, but for the maintenance of that thing into the into the future. Yeah, and then there there are other pitfalls just in terms of tooling and finding the right combination of software and versions and dealing with versions of things um, that I guess you have the same problem in proprietary software, but, but um, if you build a platform that requires version one of the software and version two of that software, and you expect it to kind of keep working when version two comes out, the software you know, can change and you, you might land up having built an open source thing for a customer which needs things which no longer quite work the way they used to. And this is normally managed with you know, support agreements and conversations with the customer to explain, look, you know, it's going to work today, but if you want it to work in two years' time or 10 years' time, you need to also invest part of your project funding into that sort of maintenance and upkeep. Sorry, I just want to jump in here because when you're talking, especially focused on, on QGIS here, it made me think like, okay, so are we talking about adding something to the core of QGIS? Because I could see that being a problem with the community. If you want to inject your, your button there that was going to drag down Instagram builders of Kim Kardashian, that, that was a brilliant example, by the way. But what would happen if I wanted to build a Kim Kardashian plugin Am I facing the same sort of troubles with the community or the same considerations? Potentially, yes, but um, I think you probably get low resistance for a Kim Kardashian plugin. But if you were trying to, there, there are other things that come up on people's radars if you're building plugins. So we, we kind of call the, the plugin a bit more uh, like an open arena where people can bring their own ideas much more freely. There's still some restrictions in terms of the licensing, for example. So uh, we had a case uh, where somebody wanted to use, for example, a Krieging algorithm, which was from a proprietary package and they sort of linked to it from their plugin uh, or people that make Mac only or Windows only or Linux only versions of plugins. And there's been a lot of discussion about whether, you know, should we allow this kind of thing? Um, are they crossing a line in terms of the licensing and so on? So there are sometimes resistance and also just the approval process, you know, plugins need to meet a certain standard in order to be accepted into the QGIS plugin repository, for example. So we actually have almost three levels because you've got the QGIS core project where I would say that the standard is uh, much higher and the barrier to entry is quite a lot higher in terms of quality control and community acceptance. Then you've got plugin, the QGIS official plugin repository, where there's still quite a lot of screening that happens before a plugin makes its way in. But you can also build your own plugin repository. And we've had clients that we've done this with where we just create like an internal um, like enterprise plugin repository where they publish whichever plugins they care about or new ones they've made themselves in their own private repository. And then in QGIS, you can just go and connect to this third party repository. And they're uh, kind of the, the world's your oyster because there's nobody really screening what goes in there other than your own organization. In terms of building a, a business around this kind of software development in, in QGIS, Plugins, are they? Are you kind of competing against the community in, in some ways? Because I'm imagining if I'm, I've got a problem, 
and I think that a QGIS plugin is the way to solve that problem. But at the same time, I, I'm I'm a developer and I'm trying to make a business selling that that development that I've done. A am I competing against the community because if it's a common problem, I'm thinking that somebody's going to show up and make a plugin for free. What you're describing as a potential problem is also a huge potential asset for us. And one of the reasons we love being an open source business is that there is this huge commons of code and previously solved problems that you can go and benefit from. So maybe to flip your question around, if, I, if my customer wants to solve a problem and somebody already solved it 90% of the way, I can go to the customer and say, well, you know, Joe over there made this plugin that almost does what you want. If you pay me just the 10% difference between what you would have paid for, for a, a fresh new plugin, which solved the whole problem, you know, what Joe's missing in his plugin, I'll go and update his plugin and, uh, you know, share the code back to him. And you'll get the benefit of everything he did and everything I did, but only costing you that 10% difference or whatever the case may be. So, you know, we commonly refer to this as standing on the shoulders of giants. And it's one of the huge value propositions of open source is that for any given problem, somebody probably already at least partly solved it and I can go and learn from their experience and um, take some of their IP and include it on the assumption that I'm sharing it back in the same way that it was shared to me. So I think you, you've given us really good overview of open source and the good side of it and perhaps the, the side that people need to be a little bit more cautious of, especially if they're thinking about building a, a business around QGIS, for example. So I'm a little bit curious now, is, is there ever a time where you suggest to people that, hey, I don't think open source is for you, you should look somewhere else? We have a certain class of clients that don't want to share their work and um, they're, they're the minority of our clients. But w with those clients, we still build their tooling on open source, for example, Postgres or Django, which is a web development framework in Python or what have you, open layers. Um, but they just decide not to share their work back. And we, we'll try to convince them to share it back, uh, you know, to make it public, what have you. But if they, you know, they've decided their business model doesn't support that, we don't push the point too much. Th that's about as like far into the, like I must be in the proprietary space as we, we go. And we've never really had a customer that said, I just, you know, flat out refuse the value proposition that you bring with open source. And I want to do it all, for example, in an Esri stack with um, Microsoft SQL Server or Oracle or something in place of, for example, QGIS or Postgres or what have you. Um, I, I'm sure there is a class of customer out there that does fit that description, but we just really don't encounter them very much. And in our business, we've not really found it to be a limiting factor. And I mean, we work with a lot of um, multinational organizations and um, they usually, you know, very much on board with the idea that um, they want to like bring value to the to to their organization by not having a lot of license fees and um, expensive agreements with with companies they they have the freedom to build a solution with us and then take it and run with it and you know continue using us for support if they need it but also um, they can be quite flexible about you know how they manage the costs around what they've uh, what they've built with us is there anything on the horizon out there when you look out into open source GIS software land, is there anything on the horizon that suggests that this might not be a usable business model going forward, that this business model that you have today? I'm not, I can't think of anything offhand. I mean, I know there's a lot of, you know, sea changes coming in, in computer platforms with, you know, for example, Apple changing to ARM and I think other companies will change, you know, the basic, you know, computing infrastructure platforms. The open source has already been on ARM, for example, for a long time. Or um, and there are other, you know, in the longer term, interesting things happening in the future with VR and and what have you, which don't really have that I know of huge established um, open source software bases within those spaces, specifically VR. I'm, uh, you know, I don't I don't have any kind of doubt that once those things become popular enough, that open source will just um, just migrate onto those platforms. So. Personally, we've, um, you know, if I sort of put your question a, a, a different way, do, do we ever have any doubts that our business model will continue to serve us well in the next 10 years? I mean, I have, I have no, no doubt that it will continue to serve us well because um, th if anything, more and more people are getting on board with the idea of using open source to build their, to solve their problems.
I, I want to try and r- round off this conversation now, and I, and I want to have a little bit of time for it, because right at the start, we mentioned that part of the reason why you started the company was to address this sort of misunderstanding out there in the community that open source wasn't a viable option. And just before you, you said that more and more people are starting to understand that, that this is, you know, this is something usable, this is something we can build businesses off, this is something we can use to solve problems with. Now, I'm a little bit curious, because oftentimes we talk about open source, we say free and and open so the open part we understand early in the conversation you mentioned that nothing is free and sometimes when we think about free we think about free as being easy we think about free as being a very low barrier to entry it's in- inclusive but but it also means or could mean unsupported it could mean unreliable it could mean un- unstructured and it might even mean that it's not certain that this service or product will be available in the future Th- those are sort of huge issues to address is it getting easier and easier that sort of education side around open source when you when you're selling into to businesses? Yeah, so um, maybe I just let me pick up on that last point. I think that the open source very nicely addresses that last point, which is will it be around in the future? And assuming we're not talking about a software as a service platform like you know something equivalent to Amazon or something like that, but the the foundations of what the community of open source developers and and contributors produce. It's always going to be open unless GitHub gets wiped off the face of the earth. But even then, the source code of these different projects is so widely replicated and redistributed and redundantly available that there is very little to fear of the software ever existing, far far less so than, for example, uh, you know, Google is, I enjoy using their products, but they're often, you know, slightly chided for inventing cool new platforms and then you know making them disappear in, in two years time um, you I think you're far more insulated from that in in the open source world and in terms of free software yes so they often say free with a capital F and in, in terms of gives you freedom rather than it's a free beer or a free lunch. Um, and the freedom is that that ability to pick your vendor to customize the software to your own needs. I think there's some interesting anecdotes you know that that we can use to explain this. For example, let's say that you wanted to um, add a new, the Kim Kardashian button to Microsoft Word or to Esri or something like that. You as an individual probably, I would guess, have all close to zero chance of ever making that happen because um, there's just so many layers of marketing people and other you know, company infrastructure in place between you and a conversation with a developer um, and who has access to the source code. Whereas in the open source world, it's quite easy to just pop an email or send a tweet or what have you to one of the QGIS developers, for example, saying, uh, hi, I've got a thousand dollars in my pocket. I need a button that does this. Can you make it happen? And they say, yep. And you know, a couple of weeks later, you're actually using the QGIS nightly build with your new button added on it. So that that is an incredible amount of freedom that I did paint out some of the sort of restrictions that the working with the open source project um, impose on you. But there are also these huge amounts of freedoms that, that come separately from that um, if you operate in that framework. Um, the ability to actually change the direction of the software and improve it in, a, in very substanti- substantial ways, which would be very hard to do within the proprietary software model. I, I also usually like to explain free software or open source software in terms of a value proposition. So I've been through different phases. I think that we can sort of stereotype open source people into different groups. There are the sort of diehard um, freedom or death um, you know, group who think that the world should only be built with free software. Otherwise, it's somehow an inf- inferior society that we've created for ourselves. through to the other end who think that any good model is proprietary. And I'm very much pragmatic. I, I sit in the middle and I, I enjoy the fact that people build amazing things with technology and software. And so I prefer to have a conversation with, a say, a new client who's never worked in the open source um, arena before in terms of value proposition. If you took the, like, you know, just tot up the numbers, for example, let's say you're comparing a QGIS deployment to an Esri or MapInfo deployment. What is it going to cost you in terms of time? What is it going to cost you in terms of opportunity costs? So, for example, um, let's say you budget for $30,000 a year for licensing fees for a software vendor's A product, um, and then you get a new staff member and you have to now like add to that budget every time a new staff member comes. So that's that's like um, it is sort of a um, continually changing budgetary landscape you're dealing with. Whereas in the open source 
you, you get opportunity costs by being able to horizontally expand your user base in your organization with very little overhead. And then there's also opportunity costs in terms of being able to capitalize on the improvements that other people are making. And this, again, this, this standing on the shoulders of giants idea where now, so many people, if you look at QGIS, for example, we're busy lining up QGIS 3.16 release now. And I think there's maybe 150 new features, you know, like marquee features that are coming in that release that have all been added by other people, not your organization. But when you install that software, you, you without having to really invest anything, you're gaining from all of their capital expense um, that they spent on building those features. And I should say a lot, a lot of volunteer donated time as well. I don't want to sort of um, negate the fact that a lot of QGIS and other open source projects operate on a volunteer basis. So when you're adding up the costs um, and you look at it in terms of opportunity costs and of terms of um, like real world costs for deployment and managing license and, and so on, see if open source makes sense for you. And then if it does, but base your decision on that. And um, I also try to emphasize that the costs are not only financial, but they're also in terms of your agility and in terms of your ability to, you know, try different packages quickly without having to go through procurement and so on. So that's kind of the way that I would normally approach the conversation with the client and definitely not be a bombastic, you know, open source or death kind of um, salesman to our clients. Thanks, Tim, for, for going into some of the nuances uh, around those kind of conversations. It was really interesting to hear your take on it. And I appreciate the fact that you weren't sort of shoving it down the throat. This is open source. That's why it's good. It was more, this is good because it is good. And here are all the, you know, here is the value proposition and sort of really structuring it for people. Say, this is what you get. I, I really like that approach. So you're a person who, um, you've been involved in open source for quite some time. If we step back from QGIS at the moment and look at open source, you know, GIS software in, in broader terms, are there any projects out there at the moment that you think are really, really exciting? Some of my exciting things, maybe some people think I'm boring, but I know you had Paul Ramsey on the other week and um, uh, Postgres, I mean, it's it's it's. Uh, been around for quite a while now and it's almost like just infrastructure of the internet um, but I still get excited every day when I use that because it's just so amazing what you can do within this geospatial database but there are a lot of other things that are very exciting that are happening so for, um, open drone map um, ODM is a really exciting project I don't know if you've heard of it it's it's an open source project to take drone imagery and build image mosaics and elevation models and um, uh, even building 3D models and so on. I think that's hugely exciting. Just the, the, the accessibility of drones and tools like Open Drone Map mean that anybody can go out and do like create aerial surveys now when it was, you know, 10 years ago, a very specialized and expensive activity to, to be engaged in. I think, you know, like I said, a lot of the things that I find exciting, maybe people are already Treat as the fabric of the of the open source world, but you know, OpenStreetMap. Um, it's just amazing the capability that all that data provides to you as an organization. You know, I often like to to tell people that for me, like what, the reason I got started in open source is because I wanted to create a platform for social upliftment, and particularly open source GIS. My fundamental premise, my sort of life motto, is that. Um, we need to provide people with the tools they need to manage our society and environment well. And to do that, we need to give them free open source GIS tools because the simply the proprietary model hasn't serviced the you know the poorer and less um, technologically enabled segments of society. And those are the ones that very badly need these tools. And so I just get very excited when I see that you can take a person from Soweto and in a township in South Africa, for example, and with the, with the opportunity cost of buying a cheap laptop and time and motivation, you can take all of these tools that are available and actually go and build yourself a business servicing customers' needs and helping them to manage their environment better and build a better society. And so I just get just generally excited seeing how far and how capable these tools have become QGIS and Postgres and um, GeoServer and QGIS Server and everything you kind of need to actually build a business and provide solutions for customers and create your own economic environment and, you know, what the knock-on effect of that um, will be once it builds, builds a critical mass and, you know, the, the knock-on effect being that our society will improve, which is, you know, very much why I'm in this game in the first place.
Tim, I, I really want to thank you for your, for your passion that you, you brought to this episode today. It's much appreciated. Um, on behalf of the community, of the users of QGIS, thank you so much for your efforts in the past and, and the ones going forward as well. Also very much appreciated. And I'm really grateful that you had time to come on the podcast today and sort of demystify some of the ideas around open source for us. It, it's, it was a real pleasure talking with you. Before I let you go, is there anywhere where the listeners can go if they want to reach out to you or follow along or perhaps continue this conversation? I'm a Twitter file or whatever the word is. <laughs> I'm on Twitter at Tim Linux. And uh, you can also reach me at tim at cartoza.com, which you can find in the, I guess you'll put it in the, sh in the show notes. And could I slip in one last little promotional um, uh, note at the end, which is to say that if you've ever been curious about open source and always felt like it was a, a them, not us kind of activity, I just want to invite everybody who's listening to come and get involved with QGIS or Postgres or whatever you're passionate about. Um, even if you think you you don't have the skills to help, you actually do have the skills. Even if you can r just write or read or just find issues and report them or what have you. We so value everybody that comes to help and support the project and um, we really need your help. So if anybody wants to help getting started, just reach out to me and I'll point you in the right direction. Thanks again, Tim. So I really hope you enjoyed that conversation with Tim and I hope that if you're interested in being involved with an open source geospatial project, I hope that you'll reach out to Tim. I'm, I'm sure that he would love to help you get started and sort of point you in the right direction. Once again, a huge thank you to our sponsor, LandGrid.com. So if you are in need of parcel data, of boundary property data for the US, LandGrid.com is the place to go. Uh, Jerry, one of the co-founders, has been on the podcast before. And if you'd like to listen to that episode, just go back in the archives and look for polygons of, of ownership. And that's it for me. Thank you so much for tuning in again this week. It's, it's much appreciated. If you want to reach out to me for whatever reason, I'm pretty easy to find. Just Google Mapscaping, podcast host, Daniel, something like that, and, and you'll find me. I would really love to hear from you. I'd just like to ask you for one favor before you go. If you could please share this podcast with a friend, with someone you think might enjoy it, someone that, that it might help, I would really appreciate it. Okay, that's it for me. We'll talk again next week. Bye.